see you all. I like that the chat's already being used for some hellos. It's always okay to do that either before or after the meditation. So we always start with a guided sit on Wednesday nights. So you can make yourself comfortable and I'll guide us along. Hi, Mary. Taking a couple of deep breaths. And connecting briefly with our aspirations, our intentions, perhaps whatever called us to come to this program tonight. For a moment, just resting in the heart's goodness. This heart that cares. And sometimes when the heart can appreciate its own goodness, it becomes a bit easier to relax. And as the heart learns how to rest, we might also feel into some vulnerability. And learning how to embrace that too. It can take some time for this part to trust 
in this natural capacity to rest in the present moment. You can take some time, some practice to feel safe. Safe enough to open. And so we'll offer ourselves this reminder, our hearts, this reminder. All right, you can have all the time you need. I'm not gonna fight you. I'm not gonna rush you. I'm not gonna pretend that you don't need the time that you do. Breath by breath, we offer a steady application of effort, remembering to connect, And awareness, attention is sustained here in the present moment for as long as it is. And then we remember again to connect. For as long as it's possible. And then we remember again. And it's through this process that this whole art form unfolds. Vulnerability, safety, relaxation. Trust.
And we'll continue in silence now.
You can open your eyes when you're ready. Thanks for your practice, everyone. Feel free to stretch a little if you need to, or give the body what it's asking for. And if you'd like to turn on your video, you can participate in our little ritual of looking around and soaking up all the goodness in each other's faces, represented in each other's faces. If you don't want to turn on your video, that's not a problem. We can just notice your name and appreciate that you're here. Thanks. All right. So in an exploration of Samadhi connecting back to that topic, and I was just um, stating how amazing it is really that this heart knows how to be nimble. And just when it seems that there is a stuckness to what's happening, what's flowing here in the heart, and especially can feel that way um, when life is overwhelming, right? When we're inundated with a lot of bad news, which is the case um, quite regularly these days, if we're connected with what's happening politically or with in any number of ways, really, what's with uh, COVID-19 or this other pandemic of racism that's very alive and moving and changing day by day. So if we're awake to, as a human being, it can feel really, it can, you know, we're going to be like normal human beings are and flow through a lot of different emotional states, a lot of different mind states. And it can sometimes feel like we can feel the heaviness of that. And that's really normal. So we don't want to um, somehow think that there's something wrong with us or there's something wrong with our practice when we are just being really normal human beings. And then we can also be on the lookout for this heart that knows how to be nimble, right? This heart that knows how to taste joy and um, how that you know, in surprising moments, there could be some uh, distress in the heart, right? Something difficult to moving through, but also this capacity to meet it that feels sweet or even somewhat pleasant, surprisingly. And often the heart can know gratitude in these moments, like, wow, look at this. This heart knows how to care, just like this right here. And then in, in other moments, really being on the lookout for joy or patience or kindness or love or inspiration. And this was the case for me when I was listening to a talk, you know, just a simple moment listening to a talk like many of us do. Like I'm going to turn on Dharma Seed and I'm going to hear the Dharma and I'm going to see what happens. Right? And even more important than, and, and we can practice this together tonight, even more important than really tuning into what this teacher is saying, what I'm saying, what Amana was saying. It's like watching our minds, watching our hearts to see, to see if we can learn something right here in the present moment, being interested in how nimble the heart can be its flexibility, its pliability. Yeah. So it's with the flow, the regular flow of our life that we can learn what, uh, what it means to be steady. And we can learn that steadiness doesn't mean pleasant, right? It's not synonymous with pleasant. That steadiness can mean deep states of steadiness actually can feel a lot like equanimity. Equanimity is uh, a state of deep balance. 
it's a place where we are not afraid to feel we're not afraid to know we're not afraid to be with the truth it's this place of radical inclusion where we realize that everything everyone even me in all aspects of this heart belong and if we are willing to be surprised even in moments where there's some dukkha there's some distress or suffering when we're relating these moments even in moments when we're relating to our world in ways that feel painful right. we get angry or we feel grief we feel hopelessness even in these moments we can feel into this naturalness when that dissipates this naturalness of um, patience or wide spacious acceptance right right in the middle of that like this flow this process that we're in in which emotions come and emotions go difficulty rises difficulty falls we start to learn that this is just normal it's just natural it's just human and all of the conditions of our lives are natural too all of the external experiences pandemic every flavor of pandemic every flavor of racism every flavor of domination in this western world you know this is all natural too And it's in this quality that of nimbleness that we start to feel how natural it, it, it is, how natural it actually is. Gil Fronstahl says that samadhi happens when this mind is able to relax art, all of its artificial ways of being and constructing and becoming and wanting and not wanting. When this heart is able to relax that, right? Not get rid of it, but when that's sort of relaxed enough that we can start to see like, oh, this is here, as well as these really beautiful places of inspiration and calm and peace. So this process of, of finding steadiness, right, this practice of samadhi, just to go back to some of the, the things that we've covered already in the past six weeks, we can think of samadhi as this capacity of the mind to gather, to be included, but we don't wanna take that to mean force, right? Sometimes we can think that gathering means we have to pull something to us and that's not that's not the case you know as i've been explaining it's like a really a natural place that comes with steadiness of effort and practice it's a willingness to it's a willingness of this heart to feel like to understand that everything belongs every mind state every emotion even every moment of rejection if that can be met with awareness that also supports steadiness. There are a couple of people with their microphones on. I'm wondering if we can um, just mute ourselves now a little bit. Thank you. So not only is samadhi this experience of unification where the mind kind of collects itself, and it's the energy of samadhi is, is actually mind, body, speech energies that are suffused, right? So the strength of intimacy, when we know what it's like to be intimate in practice, 
we tend to feel into this intimate connection. So this is one of the ways that we know the experience of samadhi. We feel a deep presence and a deep connection right here in the present moment. It's like when the mind lands on the body, you know, we can be distracted and all of a sudden we go like, okay, oh, do I have a body? Oh yeah, I have a body and I can feel it. That's a moment when the mind is steadying, the heart is steadying. Or we feel, take a couple of deep breaths and feel that. That's how we know the experience of samadhi right there. There's this steadying that's happening as this heart learns how to be intimate. So not only is it a gathering or collecting, but it's actually a, a, a widening, like this relaxed state that allows for a widening of awareness. It's, and I was trying to highlight this in the meditation for us earlier, that in this relaxation, awareness becomes willing, this heart becomes willing to include anything, there can sometimes be this feeling of vulnerability, like, ah, oh, all of the defenses have been relaxed. All of the ways of constructing protection, all of the ways of artificially, like Gil was saying, artificially constructing become relaxed and sometimes drop together altogether. And it's in that place, right, that we begin to feel into deep truth, like the truth of our own mortality or the truth of having no control. So we get to touch into the truth of nature, that experience that what we know has been constructed in many mind moments before. We can start to understand karma a little bit. I'm not gonna go into that too much, but just to say that, you know, this is an understanding of cause and effect. So when the heart starts to understand what it's like to be in a process of studying, we start to understand cause and effect. Like, oh, when I indulge this delusion, it has an impact. When I allow my mind to spin out of control, it has an impact, right? When I indulge a fantasy or a story, and that's not to say that won't happen on its own. This is normal too, this is human. But we, and we can see this in the world too. When we, as a culture, as a collective, indulge habits of consumption, habits of greed, it depletes, it kills. We see this happening with our earth and the natural resources. We can see this happening as minds play out, unrestrained minds, untrained minds play out the greedy tendencies, the seeds of greed, the seeds of aversion, hatred, ill will, how this has an immediate and noticeable, really noticeable impact, especially on people of color. So it's not to get tied about that, but this is what starts to make itself known in moments as the mind becomes more and more steady, like, oh, look at this, all this vulnerability. This is just nature. I start to see like, oh, this is a natural, Thing that happens, cause and effect. I don't have that much control. This body is doing what the body does. This heart is doing what the heart does. All of these moments that I can know right here in the present moment have been seated before. This moment is the residue of a previous moment. This moment, the seeds that I plant in this moment will grow and develop into habits down the road.
So it's not a, it's a very courageous practice that we're engaging in, this practice of studying, this practice that leads to clear seeing. It's a deep and renewing relationship with the present moment, an ever deepening and ever renewing relationship with the present moment. In chapter th three, Kitty Saro is like a wonderful storyteller. And he's uh, telling stories about some of the um, challenges to the steady mind, right? And his teacher, his teachers who uh, give him good advice. So one of the points he makes is that praise and blame, that we have to be careful as human beings that we are have this tendency to embrace praise and want to avoid blame, but that those two extremes are both traps for us, is that when we indulge one, we're necessarily indulging the other, right? And it's not wise for us to, to, um, to stake a claim to praise because we will inevitably lose that battle. Right? I wanted to rate, and, and I wanted to read a little bit um, from the book. He's such a wonderful storyteller. And this is um, from one of his teachers. As one of his teachers quoted from an ancient sage, and this is the passage. Let them slander, they can curse as they please. They are simply holding a torch aloft, trying to burn the sky. Certainly they will tire themselves out before long. When I hear this harsh talk, it tastes to me as fine as sweet dew. When smelted through suddenly, we enter an inconceivable state. Let them slander, they can curse as they please. They are simply ho holding a torch aloft. It's like prioritizing the learning, watching the mind that can get seduced, holding a torch aloft. So it's like, even slander doesn't have to be a problem because we use that as our teacher. It's a high bar, isn't it? <laughs> Let them slander. They can curse as they please. They are simply holding a torch aloft. Trying to burn the sky, certainly they will tire themselves out before long. When I hear this harsh talk, it tastes to me as fine as sweet do. When smelted through, suddenly went into an inconceivable state. An inconceivable state. It's hard to imagine that we would, could have the steadiness of mind that tastes, you know, slander as sweet do. Receives it. What can I learn? Trust that even words that hurt, words that injure, will run their course. So this is kind of long, but it's a great story and I hope you enjoy it. This is Kitty Sorrow. The nature of life includes praise and blame, pleasure and pain, success and failure, honor and dishonor. These are the uh, worldly winds. These experiences are unavoidable, but if we attach to the positive dimensions of these worldly con conditions, it's like picking up that poisonous snake heedlessly by the tail. We get bitten and suffer. During my monastic life, I received a lot of affirmation and support. Although I struggled with sickness and couldn't always join in work projects or the daily routine, the monks would come to my room to take a breather, enjoying the space without any pressure. I had time to listen and hang out, and as a consequence, often found myself helping to negotiate conflicts or tensions that arose between various individuals. In general, I was well-liked, and when it came my turn to run a small monastery in Devon, the west of England, I received a very positive response to the public talks and teachings I would offer. My three years as abbot of that monastery were very happy, and a good sense of community developed around me. Of course, being popular is not the aim of monastic life. 
but nevertheless, the positive camaraderie was supportive of my well being in the midst of my struggle with ongoing sickness. However, I have also received blame and harsh criticism, particularly since leaving the robes after having been a Buddhist monk for 15 years. It takes a lot of steadiness of mind and internal reflection to not perpetuate resentment, particularly if the blame seems unfair or untrue. And then he goes on to say, He had a question for his teacher, Master, uh, Master Hua. In my question to the master, I was hoping for confirmation about what was happening to me in this particular meditation that he was doing. About what was happening to me or some kind of esoteric transmission on the Kuan Yin Dharma door. A cryptic teaching on taking criticism as sweet do was the last thing I expected or particularly wanted. He said, as for getting flack and disapproval, that's not a problem. We should accept any crit criticism that comes our way. We should simply change our faults as they arise. If the criticism is inaccurate and useless, then you can happily ignore it. It doesn't matter. Then he quoted that quote from the ancient sage. Let them slander. They can curse as they please. They are simply holding a torch aloft for our benefit, right? Trying to burn the sky, certainly they will tire themselves out before long. When I hear this harsh talk, it tastes to me as fine as sweet dew. When smelted through, suddenly we enter an inconceivable state. Master Hua went on to explain, if you can take the slander as your good and wise advisor, then it acts just like fertilizer for your wisdom field. Drink the sweet dew of harsh words. Once you are smelted through, your work is done. Your state is inconceivable. In fact, this opposition is what you bring to your success. It, it is what brings you to success. Not simply because there is slander, but because you have been able to contemplate the cursing as level and equal. You have turned a very difficult situation into fertilizer for the crops of your merit and virtue garden. for the crops of your merit and virtue garden. I don't know about you, but when I get criticized, I often get defensive. Is it just me? <laughs> Not just me, huh? It feels like a high bar, but that it's, it's a beautiful uh, example of that possibility, right? of the heart's capacity for studying. So we shouldn't lose hope in moments when it feels like we're just floundering a bit, even drowning, sometimes underwater with hopelessness or fear or anger. We shouldn't worry. Right? We should just continue to practice using our practice to meet the present moment, to be intimate with the way things are, and trust that potential, you know, when we feel the nimbleness of mind, the movement, like, oh, this comes and this goes. It doesn't stay here forever. That this is the mind doing the work of studying. And that work of studying continues and deepens with time and patience. Ajahn Suchito says, Samadhi arises not of forcing the mind onto the breath, but out of a relationship of ease, contentment, trust, and steadiness. So trying to force ourselves into a place of acceptance is not going to help. But the steady moment-to-moment -moment practice cultivating a relationship of ease, relaxation, this heart knows how to accept its vulnerability, its fragility, and all the flavors that flow of that. I'm always curious 
you know, for me, I have a real interest in daily life practice and always curious of looking for examples in my immediate uh, life and also in the wider world. And I've been um, struck by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, some of you know her. She's a um, state representative from New York. And I'm gonna post something in the chat in just a minute. And it's an, an interview with um, Cornell West and another person whose name I can't remember right now. There we go. And it's uh, at about 52 minutes. So you can, if you wanna open it on your computer, then you'll have it um, when this program's over and you can watch it then. But at about 52 minutes, she starts to talk about um, her spiritual practice of non-attachment. It's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. And she kind of goes on, um, on and on about how important it is to not be attached to anything. And she uses her seat in Congress as an example of that. One of the things she said, my mission is to advance principles of a better world. If I'm overly attached this, to the seat, I cannot do my job. My mission is to advance principles of a better world. If I'm overly attached to the seat, I cannot do my job. So, and to think, and she, she talks about what it's like to be a young representative. She's only about 30 years old and she's been in the news recently. Some of you may have seen um, her. She gave a really um, enlivened, fierce speech not long ago um, following an incident that happened on the on the steps to her job, um, she one of uh, her colleagues uh, said some really ugly things to her, including calling her an effing, a fucking bitch, is what he said. And so she gave this kind of lion's roar to Congress, um, talking about you know her, the impact, really. And so as she was giving this interview, describing what it's like to be a young congressperson who is committed to making the to values that support making the world better, right? And what that means in terms of her own willingness to step into the line of fire, her own willingness to be courageous, to speak truth to power. And so just I was really, as I was watching this, um, and I hope you have the chance to too, just really uh, and trying to understand what it's like to be her. What it's like to be her, this young woman, congressperson um, who takes a lot of flack because she is not afraid, or maybe perhaps she is afraid in moments, but still willing to speak truth, to really align with her own values and make good on that. And even and be and her willingness to give up everything for that, right? Her willingness to give up, knowing from the very moment she stepped in the door that she was going to get blasted, and she was going to you know be challenged by people who want to take her seat. So the only way to persevere persevere is to find some place of steadiness, and that place of steadiness is not being attached to anything to her own ego, to her job, to her role. And so this feels like really spiritual practice for me and hopefully for us. Like what are what is bringing us back to our cushion, to the practice of intimacy? What are those values that align us right here? with our interest in waking up. It can be useful to start off a meditation period like that or to start your day like that. Like, sweetie, what are my deepest aspirations right now? And so whatever comes our way, 
whether it be emotion, you know, hopelessness or fear or surprising moments of joy, not to get attached to any of it, but just to continue to put forth effort to transform this heart, to be of service, to participate, to be engaged in the world. So this is the art, this is the, the depth of steadiness, really connecting deeply with our aspirations and allowing that to guide us and uh, do amazing things. I wonder if at 10 years old, AOC knew that she would be this fearless, this courageous, this fierce. It's probably true for each of us that we don't know the extent that we might be willing to go when really aligned in that steady place. You know, I've brought John Lewis up in previous talks, but that enduring, persevering energy over 60 years or more, that's the, that's like the ideal kind of competent heart. So as we talk about and practice, study samadhi, the samadhi that in really deep states leads to equanimity, this balance of mind, this balance of mind that can accept anything, right? That isn't isn't pulled off our square by anything, by slander, being called uh, uh, awful names that I don't need to keep repeating. Or whatever it is. Steadiness. I don't know about you, but in in moments when I can really remember like the high bar, it helps me keep going like, oh, there's so much more to learn, just keep going. What can you do right now? What is it right now? Is it possible to be right with this walk? Is it possible to be with this meal? Is it possible to be right here in the middle of this conversation, in the middle of this interpersonal conflict with someone you love? You know, these are the places where we really learn. With the heart learns how to be brave. The heart learns how to rest in its vulnerability. And here, and we learn our own resiliency. We learn to accept all parts of who we are because that starts to come to the surface. Like, oh, this human being is a mess. Yeah. Can I accept it? Can I accept the mess that I am? <laughs> the imperfect mess that I am. And with more and more good effort, then the yes becomes stronger and more frequent. Yes, I can accept all that I am. And yes, I can accept all that you are. And yes, I can accept the, the world in its current state. And yes, in that acceptance, my eyes are wide open. I don't have to distract myself. This heart learns how to not distract, like just eyes wide open. Uh -huh, it's like this, I don't have to turn away. And when I don't have to turn away, then I really know, right? You can really see. Like this country, we have a problem with racism. There's no doubt about that. Uh -huh, I can see that right now. And it's that steadiness of yes, yes, it is like this. Yes, I can accept that. Yes, I am willing that allows me to play in this territory to get stronger and more resilient and patient and courageous and fierce and wise to use my life energies well. Yeah. Equanimity is the state where um, like, uh, it feels like this place where all our positive mind states converge. 
and sometimes one takes the lead and sometimes another takes the lead. But in this way of um, balancing this deep place of steadiness, sometimes patience takes the lead, sometimes kindness takes the lead, sometimes joy takes the lead. Too much of any of these, even positive mind states, can throw the mind out, the heart out of balance. But in this deep training of studying, we get to see all of the forces that go, go into uh, that support balance, right? So we might be on the lookout for that in our lives. Like, when do I feel at balance? Oh, what are, what's up here then? What's up for me right now? Oh, I can see that this heart is patient. Oh, interesting. Or I can see that this heart is nimble. Well, isn't that interesting? The heart can go from grief to joy in a few moments. Oh, look at that. This heart knows how to be joyful. Oh, look at that. If this heart gets attached to that joy, then it's out of balance again. If this heart gets attached to praise, it's out of balance. But if it, appreciate, it appreciates the positive feeling that comes from being in a relationship with others who appreciate each other, well, that's a different thing. Right? Then there can be some balance. So playing in this territory of equanimity and getting curious about what it takes to stay balanced. Thank you for listening tonight. And there's still a bit of time left if anybody has comments or reflections or questions. Objections are always welcome too. It's just nice to share our practice, to hear how things are going for each of us. It's a part of being a learner. Oh yeah, it's like this for me. It hasn't been like that for me, I don't know. I can kind of get what, what you mean, Shelly, in these ways, but I'm not sure about this. That's great, then we're a community of learners. Hi, Shelly, it's Robert. You're I was Robert. thinking of what, um, Michelle Obama would say, you know, when they go low, we go high. And it's such a great comment. Yeah, it is a good comment. And not because we're avoiding feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Because we find that capacity to go high right with the feeling. Yeah. That's what we're learning. Mary, were you going to say something? Well, I just am so grateful for your this talk. I've been thinking a lot about equanimity of late. And one of the places, this is trite, but oh well, um, one of the places that is really instructive for me on equanimity, I realized last Friday I was golfing. And I've been golfing now for, for 60 years. And I'm not any better than I was when I was about age 10. But what I notice is um, it's a great instruction for me because my attitude, what happens is if I hit a good shot, I get attached to that and think, oh, if I keep up this good shot, then I'm going to have X score and I'm going to be really happy about that score. And then the next shot, I shoot it way out of bounds or do something. And then I get really attached to that and tell myself bad things about myself. And isn't this terrible because I'm going to have a terrible score. So it was just such a perfect lesson in this really teeny little way about the importance of equanimity. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I would throw that out there. Thank you. Yeah.
we can learn all that we need to learn from, you know, just, just by watching our minds doing the things that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, golfing. Anybody else? This is, this is Jennifer, she, her. I just really resonated with um, the uh, talking about how nimble the heart is. And I was um, walking my dog the other day and um, feeling really, really depressed and, and being aware of my depression and getting more depressed and and this um, elderly man who who always is, I see him and we always smile, but never talk. And then he, he said, hey, how are you doing? And I said, you know, I'm really depressed. And he said, well, what's that about? And we just started talking and, you know, my heart just went from so, so, so feeling so disconnected and devastated to just this bounce of of joy and just connecting with this this person that um and he was an african american gentleman and i thought i bet you you've seen a lot and i bet you've been really depressed and that he reached out to me like that. It was just this burst of, like I wanted to bawl my eyes out. And so I just went from the depths to the heights and um, looking, practicing looking at that so that I can find that, that balance. But the nimbleness, it's important for me to remember that, that it's, that it's just a, just a moment that's happening. So, yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. And it's 9.01. So, Patrice, would you? So, let's take a moment to um, so I said, sort of collect ourselves and just think about all the goodness in our lives, um, the goodness of being together this evening, um, giving support to each other, getting support from each other. And if there's any benefit to our, our practice, to our efforts, we would happily, gladly, wholeheartedly share it with our parents, our teachers, our friends, our community, with all those suffering particularly from injustice, for those suffering from COVID-19 in so many ways, all those beings throughout the planet are all in this together. And we wish for all of us, may we all find some ease. May we all find some mm -hmm. equanimity. May we all find some freedom. May we all be well. Thank you, Patrice. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful, peaceful, equanimous, steady week. Hopefully, I'll see you again. Thank you. Good night, thank you.